adults think they're not creative, uh, but children do. That's true, isn't it? Broadly speaking. Um, in fact, I want to give you a quick test, if I could. Well, I'm going to. So, <laughs> um, how creative do you think you are, personally? I mean, if you would, think of that on a 10-point on a scale, with 10 at the top. OK? It's important to know that 10 is the top. And uh, where would you put yourself on a scale of 1 to 10? While you're thinking about that, uh, have a think about this. How intelligent are you on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 at the top? Now, uh, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. You don't have to. You can say, I'm sorry, I did not come to Zeitgeist for this type of thing. I'm, <laughs> I'm a grown-up. You put your hand up, you might think. <laughs> but uh, assuming you're willing to, uh, let me just give you an assurance that if you do put your hands up, there are no social consequences. <laughs> I mean, for me. <laughs> I mean, it could, <laughs> could be social death for you, for all I know. But, uh, but what I mean is I'm not going to drag anybody up here and ask you to demonstrate anything. Uh, it's uh, purely a straw poll for the purpose of conversation. Uh, so with that caveat in mind, um, would you put your hands up if you give yourselves 10 for creativity? Was that a vote or a scratch? <laughs> All right, one, yeah. nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Where was the average? Did you think of that? Yeah, I'd say, yeah. How about intelligence? Now, I know a certain social modesty comes into play here, but, uh, <laughs> but this is zeitgeist, so get over it, you know, so. <laughs> How about 10? Any 10s for intelligence? No? Nine? Thank you. Two at the back, thank you. Actually, you can go now, if you like. <laughs> really, we're just wasting your time, honestly, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three. It's getting pens, isn't it? <laughs> Two. Any twos? OK. I never do one, by the way. If you've got one, you're not following this anyway, are you, to be honest? So. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the top of that curve, would you think? In intelligence. About seven again? Okay. Eight. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, one last question. Last time you have to put your hands up. Uh, put your hands up if you gave yourself different marks for intelligence or creativity. Okay. Now, the reason I ask you this is, I mean, I think you're all wrong, by the way. Yeah, obviously, apart from the two nines, obviously, I mean, <laughs> never argue with a nine is my view, but, um, but the reason I say it is that I think most people operate on a very limited conception of creativity and of intelligence. So my question is, what were you thinking of when you gave yourself the mark? Uh, when you decided you could give a number for creativity, what was in your mind? Uh, when you gave yourself a number for intelligence, what was it you were thinking of? Um, you see, my experience of it is that people operate on all kinds of misconceptions about creativity. I think it's why that last conversation was so important. They think it's all about the arts. Well, the arts are terribly important, but it's not just about the arts. They think it's about special people. It's really not. I mean, if you're a human being, it comes with a kit. You know, you are born with tremendous creative capacities. Um, the trouble is that creativity is a bit like literacy. You may have an aptitude for it, but never develop the abilities that are required to exercise it. And that, to me, is a big fault of our education system. Um, and the third misconception is there's nothing you can do about it. You're creative or you're not, and that's the end of it. And I believe there's a great deal you can do to make yourselves more creative. The whole theme of this conference is about linking together these two worlds, or this session, the inner world and the outer world. And I believe that our education systems currently um, are failing to keep pace with the developments in the external world, uh, which are moving with a tremendous speed and depth of change. And they have never been good 
at connecting with our inner world. Uh, that very many people go through their education having no real sense of what lies deep within them. I'm convinced of this, that we're all born with tremendous natural talents, but very few of us actually get to tap into them, to tap into the, the depth of them. Just on this external world, by the way, I mean, I published a book 10 years ago called Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative. Um, and I was asked if I would like to make any changes to it last year. Uh, we're bringing out a new edition. Uh, the publisher said, you're going to do the 10th anniversary edition, would you like to make any changes? Well, it seemed to me improbable, frankly, you know, that it could be improved <laughs> in any way. It, it, it was, after all, a masterwork you know, that I had written myself. Uh, but I decided under some pressure I'd make a few changes possible. I, I had in mind a weekend with a spell check you know, and, and a bottle of burgundy. Yeah, that was the plan. I actually rewrote the entire book from start to finish. Uh, I don't think there's a single word unchanged in the entire book. Uh, and the reason is that so much has happened in 10 years. Just in 10 years. I mean, Google is responsible for quite a bit of this, I think. But 10 years ago, there were no smartphones, were there? there were no iPads, uh, no iPods. I know that's not a Google idea. Um, uh, there were no social media. I mean, Alison talked about interviewing uh, uh, Zuckerberg here when it was just a faint idea in his head. Um, there was no Twitter 10 years ago, was there? I mean, 10 years ago, people didn't tweet, did they? I mean, if they did, they were discouraged, weren't they? People would, <laughs> people would say, what was that? And, and do you mind not doing that again? We're trying to eat in here. You know, if, it, if you have to tweet, go outside and do it. But now, you know, if you're not tweeting on a regular basis, if you haven't tweeted this morning, you feel socially inadequate. I mean, this is just in the space of 10, days, uh, 10 years. Uh, so we know the external world is changing with a fantastic rate and profundity. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to rewrite the book. By the way, I rewrote the book on Microsoft Word. Uh, do you use Microsoft Word? Yes, well, uh, I like it, but you may have noticed Microsoft Word has opinions, doesn't it? It, it, um, it tends to give you little squiggles. Uh, if it, there are two sorts of squiggles. There's squiggles that point out you've made a mistake. I'm fine with that. The squiggles I don't like are where they disapprove of what you've just said. <laughs> like the passive voice, they don't like it. And they, uh, why? What has this got to do with Bill Gates? We don't know. Uh, if you use the passive voice, they give you squiggles and suggest helpful alternatives. I wrote this sentence. The foundations of the modern intelligence test were laid in the late 19th century by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. That's true, by the way. It's a beautiful sentence, isn't it? <laughs> I'll read it again for you. It's that good, I'm feeling. The foundations of the modern intelligence test were laid in the late 19th century by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. Microsoft Word didn't like that. Uh, it has the passive voice in it, were laid. So it helpfully suggested this alternative in the active voice. In the late 19th century, Sir Francis Galton laid a cousin of Charles Darwin. <laughs> the foundation of the modern intelligence test. <laughs> I thought, really, I'm... I had no idea. But, <laughs> but I rewrote the book uh, using Microsoft Word, for lack of an alternative, um, because so much has changed in the world around us. The rate of technological change has transformed everything, and it will continue to. I mean, people here are much more expert at this than I am, but you will know, I'm sure, that 10 years from now, the book will have to be rewritten again. Many of the things that we think are so smart and groovy just now will be discarded within 10 years. I mean, I think if you show your grandchildren your iPad, they will smile at you uh, with a kind of patronizing look uh, of how quaint it was that you, you thought this was so exciting. You know, that you actually had to hold something in your hand, <laughs> like an actual object. Um, because, I mean, the work we've been seeing on robotics, you can multiply that with what's happening in cloud computing and everything else. It's pretty clear that 10 years from now, all of these things that we think are so advanced will be primitive in all likelihood. The other factor is population growth. That's, uh, I think, about to present us with challenges that people haven't faced up to. There was a very good program on the BBC. Uh, there are many good programs on the BBC. This happens to be one of them. Uh, about, well, last year. It was about how many people can live on Earth. And it was called, How Many People Can Live on Earth? The, 
the BBC have a great gift for titles, I find. And, uh, and they came to this view. You know, there are now 7.5 billion people on the planet, seven and a half, well, heading for 7.5 billion, which is more people than the whole history of humanity um, by a long way. Uh, and we don't know if the Earth can handle it. So they said if everybody on Earth were to consume at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, you know, consume food, fuel, water, um, air, space, they said if everybody on Earth were to consume at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, uh, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion people. Uh, so we're halfway to that. The trouble, of course, is we don't all consume at the same rate as they do in Rwanda. They said if everybody on Earth were to consume at the same rate as the average person in North America, that's us, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.2 billion. So we're five times past that currently. Uh, so if everybody on Earth wanted to live as we do in North America, and by the way, they do, uh, we would need four more planets to make this feasible, uh, which we don't have. And there's a paradox here. All of these challenges are created by human ingenuity and human innovation and creativity. It's not the lemurs that are causing the problem. It's us. Uh, and at the very point where we need to get even more innovative, more inventive, more ingenious to deal with the challenges that we have created, our education systems are stifling the very capacities on which we're about to depend. And this is, I just want to get to this, that there are these, we really live in two worlds, don't we? There's a world, as a, a guy called Robert Wicken once, I thought very nicely put it, there's a world that exists only, you know, that exists whether or not you exist. A world that came into being before you did, it was here before you got here, it'll be here all being well after you've gone. It's the world of other people, events, other circumstances. Our education systems are pretty obsessed with that world. Um, but there's another world that exists only because you exist. It's the world of your own private consciousness, the world that came into being when you did. The world, as somebody once said, where there's only one set of footprints a world of your private passions, your motivations, your aspirations, your hopes and your talents. And I believe the future of the world around us, as far as we're concerned, depends on understanding much more about the world within us. And the more standardized our education systems become, the less amenable they are to allowing us to make those explorations. You have no idea what your talents are, I'm sure. How many of you have got children, can I ask you? How about two children? Okay, and the rest of you have seen such children, small, <laughs> small people wandering about. I will make you a bet. If you've got two or more children, uh, or you have two or more siblings, or, or friends, <laughs> I hope that's now included everybody, but if you've got two or more children, I'll make you a bet. My bet is that they are completely different from each other, aren't they? Completely different from each other. No matter how alike they may be in some respects, you would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. <laughs> you know, I'm constantly being mixed up here. And the reason I point to it is this, that our education systems are based on three principles which are the opposite of how human life flourishes. Apart from that, they're great. The first one is conformity. Our systems are becoming more and more standardized. Whereas the great pulse of human life is diversity. We are here in all our varied differences. We are centers of unique talents and possibilities, each of us and every child. The second is our education systems are based on compliance, more and more. Whereas the energy of human life is creativity and innovation. It's why you're right to say at the MIT Media Lab, kids come from college and they cannot innovate anymore. It's kind of been educated out of them. But the third is this. Human life is organic. We create our lives. Our education systems are based on a prince of linearity. I would bet that very few of you are living the life now that you anticipated you'd be living when you were at school. Is that correct? I mean, we submit to a, um, a fiction here. There comes a point in your life where you have to write your resume. And you set it all out as some linear narrative, don't you? You put headings in and certain things in bold. You pick them out to, make, to try and make your life look as if it's all uh, run along some very well-planned strategy you know, to take you from your childhood to your present position of eminence. Um, but of course, it's not at all like that. I mean, you do that because the last thing you want to do is to convey in your resume the actual chaos you've been living through, you know, the actual decisions you've made all along the way. Now, we are paying a very heavy price for this. 
this failure to help people plumb the world within them. Currently, uh, in the United States, almost 10% of 14 to 19 year olds are on drugs to treat attention deficit disorder, ADHD. The people prescribing them will tell you, in some cases these are genuine instances, in many cases it's based on the quickest and most subjective of assessments. Um, our kids are being drugged often to get them through this education system in a way that's unprecedented. F nearly five and a half million children in America are on these drugs to get them to focus on things which are presumably otherwise rather tedious for them. Um, a minimum of a third of kids who enter high school in America do not graduate. It's as high as 60% in some parts of the country. I was in Houston, Texas recently. I was told by the superintendent 60% of kids don't graduate high school. That's a catastrophe. In um, America, where we are now, where I live, one in 31 Americans is in the correctional system. I don't mean to say if you drop out of school, you end up in jail, of course not. But what is true is that very many people in the correctional system did not complete their education. And many states are spending more money on the correctional system now while reducing it on the education system. And the other fact you might just dwell on is that uh, a couple of years ago, sales in America of antipsychotic drugs that were previously only given to people who were uh, in mental care, uh, sales of that category of drug exceeded sales of anti-cholesterol drugs and drugs for acid reflux. It's now a $14 billion industry. If you wanted evidence that the world within us is in bad shape on a grand scale, I think they're just some of the examples I could give. So what I'm saying is if we're serious about exploring the world around us, we have to explore the world within us. Uh, and we do that, as Van Jones, I thought, said beautifully earlier, by looking again at the broad structure of education. We need to restore arts programs, sports programs. We need to reprofessionalize the teaching profession. Above all, we have to personalize education to every child in the system. And we have the technology now for the first time in human history to do it. The last thing I just want to say is there was um, uh, a great thing on The Onion, do you know that website, The Onion, uh, about how we have to save the planet. I'm, very, I'm optimistic that you know, we have the powers within us to do it, but, um, but we have to attend to them. The, the Onions uh, were saying, look, don't worry about saving the planet. The planet will be fine. As we saw at the very beginning of that fantastic image of the cosmos, of, of the Milky Way, um, we are a very small part of all of this. The Earth has been around for four and a half billion years. Human beings like us showed up. I don't mean like Neanderthal creatures. I mean groovy people like us, you know, with, a, you know, with attractive profiles and a sense of irony. You know, like we, we showed up at less, probably less than 100,000 years ago. If you think of the whole arc of the, the, the lifespan of the Earth as one year, human beings showed up at less than a minute to midnight on the 31st of December. Um, so the onion said, look, you know, don't worry about the planet. The planet's going to be fine. It's got another four and a half billion years left yet. You know, we may not make it. You know, I mean, the planet may conclude, you know, we tried humanity. Not so good. You know, <laughs> not the idea we thought it would be. We're going back to bacteria. They had a fantastic run. You know, <laughs> don't worry about the planet. Worry about us and what we can do to live harmoniously with it. As we saw in those wonderful photographs of the Arctic. I mean, that tragedy of the slaughter of the dolphins, I think, will live with all of us. We are despoiling the very planet on which we depend, and we won't, I think, make a better job of it until we understand the depth of our own talent and spiritual resources within us. When I asked you how intelligent you are, it's the wrong question. The real question is, how are you intelligent? The question is not how creative are you, it's how are you creative? And if we can flip our education to get to a better sense of human capacity, then I think we'll have a better chance of understanding and making sense of the world within us and the world around us. By the way, there was a wonderful quote from H.G. Wells, the uh, science fiction writer in the early 20s. He said, civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. Now, it may or may not be the case, but what we do know is that the great bridge between the two worlds that we live in is education. And I think we have to rebuild it so that we can build a bridge to the future. Thank you very much.